So it's by the Craig Forrest for a moment, but that's okay because Calm joins us. Calm, thanks so much for joining Footy Prime. Episode three, still on the airwaves for some reason. Um, <laughs> a, a real easy, first of all, congratulations, by the way, for what is a big week for you uh, in the Hall of Fame, but a nice easy one off the top, all right? <laughs> is Canada a soccer nation? Is it even a sports nation? Well, <laughs> I would have said yes. I would have said yes, home run. 2026 on its way, and then I hear some Toronto citizens don't want to have the World Cup here because of the taxpayers' money and things like that. So when you're talking about a city not wanting to host a World Cup, especially a men's World Cup and a women's, I mean, that that really changed my mind. So I hope they can uh, prove us wrong uh, tomorrow at BMO. Interesting. Carm, um, we, put a, we put a poll up last night on Footy Prime uh, on our Twitter and basically, we asked, is Canada a soccer nation? And to your point, 34% said yes, and 57 to close to 60% said no. It's changed now, actually. Oh, it's updated, changed. Actually. There's, more, there's, there's fewer no's than there were before. Well, but how does, I guess, what does Canada becoming a soccer nation look like? To, and that's a question for you, Karen, but I think for Jimmy and Amy, I think that's a really important one, too. Who's going to start? <laughs> You're the start. guest right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I'll give it a go. Um, you know, there's some obvious low-hanging fruit. I mean, I don't want to get into anything too deep and political and why we can't do things, but I think hosting more often, I don't I don't think when you, can, you can't even see your home nation play um, too often, I mean, I think that, that causes a lot of issues. And then with regards to, for example, women's football, where do people start to fall in love with that? Genuinely, you know, where do you start to actually see these hometown heroes? Can we start to play uh, on one soccer or otherwise some more leagues? You know, it's just that exposure. I think we have to start there just to, to kind of get those casual fans. And the diehards are always going to show up. Like, I'm super happy to hear 28,000 people will be there tomorrow night. I mean, that's that's amazing. Uh, I think we continue to see that on the one off events. But until we get to see it more and it's more in your face a bit in the, in the best possible way, I think it's going to be challenging. I agree with that. I agree with Carm. I think far too often, and from my experience, just coming back playing with the national team, and I, I remember I'd be in the hotel and I'd, I'd go home to see my parents and I'd see a couple of friends and they'd be asking me, why are you, why are you home? I'd be like, because I'm playing with the national <laughs> team in two days. Nobody knew about all the games that were happening. The advertising was, was terrible. And then also, we need more games in this country, but not just the, the men's and women's first teams. The U-17s, mm -hmm. you never see them playing in their own backyard. You never see the under-20s playing or the Olympic team that are qualifying, playing friendlies. Like We never see any of the youth teams play, which is crazy. It blows my mind. And that's all part of creating awareness, watching the, the youth. Then all of a sudden you go watch the U-20s, U-17s, and now they're in the first team. So now you can relate to these kids because you've been watching them go through their path. Mm -hmm. but, but do you think the fan base is here to support those games? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. I mean, like you said, Calm, there's hardcore fans being around for years, right? And, and you know, in, in the world that we operate, we, we live and breathe with these fans. So I think we get a skewed vision We've met of them. Canada. We're friends with them almost, yeah. okay. right? Like, but, but our lens is skewed, yeah. I think. Yeah. Compared to a proper football nation where, where everyone's watching these games and care about these games. That being said, you go to a real football nation, they're not all coming out in mass to watch under 17s play. No, but they got good crowds. And there's, a, and there's awareness there's for it. There's good crowds. There's awareness, I think that sure. as Canadians, we have a little bit of an inferiority complex that we don't think we can be builders ourselves. So it's the North American model is predicated upon developing U.S. and then Canada piggybacks on yeah. it. And then we're a Commonwealth country. So we look to Britain and we look to see what they're doing in terms of their footballing nation and their communities in that footballing culture. What makes us uniquely Canadian and how does that transfer, translate into being a footballing nation? I think you have to ask fans what that means to them. You have to ask pundits, you have to ask former players. And I mean, part of it's infrastructure, part of it's investment in sport, part of it is having, we have one domestic league, we need domestic leagues. Yeah. So Diana Matheson took a former player to come and do it, that's coming. But then it's like the, the, the support around that, how that galvanizes the grassroots, but then propels it even beyond and makes it successful and keeps it in the zeitgeist. Because right now it's, it's these one-offs, like Carm saying, like BMO sold out tomorrow, awesome. And then what happens after that? There, there's no follow-up. You need that continuous momentum, that continuals, 
cycle yeah. to, to really establish ourselves as a footballing nation. I think we're, we're a long way off. Yeah, we are. But then, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the most participated sport in this country, yep. by far, mm -hmm. by a country mile, right? So the, the interest is there. People love the, love the game. But just getting to that next level, supporting the national teams is completely different. That's where we kind of yeah. lose them, don't we? No, you're right. Um, and I, I think when we talk about professionalizing, you know, any sport, let's, we'll stick to soccer. But I mean, you, you want to start to feel that narrative and that bit of momentum, like Amy said, towards investment. So if you know, for example, if they're building facilities in Vaughan <laughs> and you start to see that that's, uh, you know, there's investment, there's a national training center coming, um, we're hosting events, we're building leagues, you know, these are all very, very positive things. But at the end of the day, I also think Canada soccer, you know, there's a bit of turmoil around federations right now. And unfortunately, we're part of that. And I think it's part of a branding concern. You know, is the sport in a good place? Is it healthy? You know, a lot of parents, I listen to a thousand narratives a day, people touching base and saying, you know, hey, is there a future for my daughter in this country or in this sport? And or can she become a coach as well? Or how do we do all these things? There's a lot of lost uh, maybe people in the sense of how do we engage with this sport from, you know, four years old, all the way from that house league, you mentioned a lot of participation, but how do I see this through even my own niece, you know, what, what's my future here, uh, anti Carm? Like, and I'm thinking you're going to have to leave and be extremely uncomfortable for about 20 years <laughs> uh, your career, uh, for yourself. And everyone's like, how do you get into coaching? I was like, I don't know. I struggled for a long time. And it, is that inspiring? No, um, crazy enough to have accepted the salaries I have and just took off, you know, like it, there's no pathway. You got to forge it yourself um, and got to be crazy enough to do it. And that shouldn't be the case. But that is coming right slowly, right? Project 8 obviously is, is massive. It's really important. The CPL is extremely important as well. But you have to have very patient owners with deep pockets prepared to, to bleed money for, for a long time. Do you think as a country we, we are prepared for that? and to stick it out for the long run, because CPL has got some great stories, but some other clubs aren't doing so well. The people aren't coming yeah. out to support it on a regular basis like they should, and like we, perhaps we, we thought they would. Right. I, I, like anything else, I think even with my coaching philosophy, leadership philosophy, it is one day at a time and you have to start. You know, you have to you have to put it out there and you have to build because even being in Mexico, for example, I happened to be there in their sixth year of existence. And was it perfect? No. Does it look like a million bucks? A hundred percent. Like they figured out a few things with regards to commercial marketing. They are bringing in sponsorships. Um, is the sporting side highly developed? I think it has a ways to go. But they're started, they're in it, they're viewing it, they're investing in it. And I think that's the key. Every year it changes. You know, NWSL, for example, 11th year, they're doubling the salary cap next year. I mean, this is mass, these are massive developments that, you know, I find that Canada, um, again, we have to start, we have to meet the sport where it's at, but we can't expect it to be shiny and amazing in year one. And that, that shouldn't be the expectation. Everything should have its do course to grow. Um, but that's why I'm so proud of Dee and her crew because, I mean, they're starting and, and that's all we can ask for at this point, to join the race. I, I just wonder, I mean, is there private money, enough private money in this country right now for, for men and women? I mean, I, I, regardless of whom it is, it's easy to point fingers right now at the CSA, CSB. We get, everyone does that. Um, I think it's way more nuanced to perhaps than a lot of people think. Um, but is the money even there at this point from private business in Canada to, to, to fund this program? Because if we're hoping that it's going to come from the, fe the federals, it ain't going to happen, right? Are, are you confident yeah, no. it's there? Yeah, I am confident it's there. I think if they can get to their sort of milestones with regards to minimum teams, people are going to want to dive into this thing. It's like anything else. You, they're not, there's not a lot of first movers. I think that's different, but I think the second it begins and people can see a great product with the minimum teams, uh, you're going to start to see more interest. I just think people are hesitant because it's never been done. All right, to the, to the real positive stuff. Uh, this week for you, Carm, uh, you know, what a career you had. Post-playing, um, you've been involved, like I mentioned, in Australia. You've been involved in, in Mexico. Uh, Nobleton, Ontario, you know, <laughs> some of these things are not like others. <laughs> but I mean, is, is, it, is it a week where you just sit back and, and look back in your career and say, wow, that, that was really something? Or, I mean, tell me how you feel, how are the emotions? Yeah, I feel, I feel extremely proud. I mean, you know, I, I'm one of those people that don't ever feel like 
a job is so much more to be done. And I, I guess it's coming off of the back of like a Megan Rapino retirement yesterday. And I'm not even putting myself in the same category, but what I'm saying is, I mean, leaving this sport better than we found it is such a lifelong job. So for me at 39, you know, just basically beginning my coaching career, I just see the journey as so rich and so much more to do. And it's great to pause and acknowledge and share this moment with Canadians and everything else. But at the end of the day, it's it, there's a lot of work to be done. And that, that's really what I see. And I don't know if that makes me uh, successful or crazy or somewhere in between. But yeah, um, it is a beautiful moment. And I'm just glad my family can be there and I'll be amongst uh, Canadian fans for the first time in a very long time. Hopefully 28,000 Canadian fans, hopefully. You know, I know Jamaica's got some support. <laughs> Yeah. But regardless, it should be a, a great event. Uh, Dubs, do you have any memories of, of playing with, with Carmen? I mean, well, had you retired so many years prior that you I can't I did. Remember? Yeah, no, Carmen and I didn't play together that often. Carmen was this young upstart player coming up from the U20 program, and I was actually unceremoniously on my way out. <laughs> <laughs> didn't take my spot or anything. Unceremoniously? But yeah, it was kind of the, like where I hurt my knee, and then I wasn't back in the program for a bit. But then, And Carmen, you, you had a period as well where you were with the team, and then you were gone for a bit and then back again. So does that make you appreciate your your career a little bit more? I mean, going into the Hall of Fame and that you're able to sort of ride out those ebbs and flows? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had three retirements, you know, one <laughs> not, by, not by choice. Such a diva. <laughs> I the, I mean, right. I mean, I don't even know again. I was like, I missed the full quadrennial, you know, cheers. And then came back. Um, gave it a go and was no guarantees that was going to work out. And then John retired me basically after the Olympics, I'll call it mutual, but kind of one-sided. And then <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, dig into that a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> suck it, her conversation. Suck it. That was, conversation. Uh, no, like I, it was funny because I had come back from, you know, Evan Pellerud had moved on uh, Carolina Maracci had come. And I, I mean, listen, I was with my mom writing emails in Italian. I would have done anything to get a, a, a you know, a tryout. So I was like, she's like, I have idea who you are um me piace you know, are you... <laughs> <laughs> me piace perfecto no but you know she was basically had no idea who I was uh, I was coaching at Louisville at the time so she just basically said do you have any interest uh any <laughs> any any chance getting yourself on a football team and I was like okay let me do that first so I quit my job um with no guarantees I put myself on a, a W League team uh, got a tryout I put myself on Robin Gale and Charlotte Nonin's team in Indiana uh, she came to that match I got a tryout and it added seven years to my career which was crazy it was a high risk high reward situation and so that worked out I guess and then after the Olympics where I wasn't really slotted to play too many games and then everybody in the world got injured um, I had to play every single minute of every game which was definitely not the plan and um, as we stood on the bronze you know John and I had a great conversation and he just said you know listen thank you for your service and <laughs> you've done great and I wish you nothing but the best and I said here you I mean, like what are you supposed to say like it was felt like my time um, so it wasn't that great a conversation was it? <laughs> Getting put in the pasture. as he as he put on the bronze medal as he gave you the bronze medal he said half off <laughs> just a little whisper you're out you're done <laughs> basically I mean in a nutshell and then I went to go coach again in the NCAA that was always my second love coaching and and then all of a sudden, you know, they had done their uh, pre or sorry, post tournament um, analysis. And he had said, look, uh, based on some of the subjective and objective information, we want to have you for the next quadrennial and uh, maybe in a different capacity, but we definitely want to have you uh, with us. And uh, I was like, wow, OK, well, I just moved into a new apartment here in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Let me sort this out because this moment will never come back. And then, yeah, retired after the home World Cup before Rio. Um, again, very much the right time to do that and new generation and all that good stuff. So, yeah, that's how it that's how it ended. And my coaching journey really started in 2016. So, so when you when you let players go now as a coach, do you take anything from that experience and how you handle it? High, high level honesty. <laughs> I mean, you have to be. You have to be. Yes, and hard conversations don't get much easier when you're dealing with people's lives. But yeah, no, I'm. 
I haven't always been great, but I'm learning how to deliver those messages. Yes. Right. So you don't tell them they stink anymore. <laughs> no, no, not, not directly. Indirectly. <laughs> That's in the email. Yeah. In Italian. In yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Carm, listen, great, great chat. Um, congratulations <laughs> on what is a, a great week for you, obviously, and for Canadian football as well, yourself and, and Richard Hastings. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you having me. Thanks, Carm. Carm, that was Charms telling you to F off. So you should feel <laughs> used to it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> So please make sure if you get a chance, get down to BMO Field on Tuesday, Canada, Jamaica, um, a huge game for Canada as they look for Olympic qualification, something they should do given the first leg. As we welcome back Craig Forrest to the show. Craig, you, you heard that. Um, I know you've got a lot of opinions about Canada as a soccer nation. I know where you want it to be. How far away are we from being, do you think, a, a real soccer nation? I'm gonna go for a T before he starts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Where do I start? Well, first of all, with Carm, I'd like to comment a bit about her. She's one of the great soccer minds in our country. She's been fantastic and she's hungry. She's ambitious. You see how she got herself into the team, how she did take those high risk opportunities. She's done that as a coach. She went to Europe. She's been in Mexico. A lot of our great minds have really been doing well outside the country. And it'd be nice to bring some of these people home. We look at the males that have done well in the United States. Mark Watson's general manager of Minnesota. Frank Yallop was LA Galaxy's manager, San Jose, winning manager in MLS, brought David Beckham over, Pat Onstad's the general manager of Houston, Mike Sweeney's part of U.S. club soccer. These are all great minds that should be doing some work here in Canada, but unfortunately, we don't have those opportunities. So that's one thing. Uh, from the, the actual standpoint of being a soccer nation, I mean, being one that spent just about 20 years outside of Canada uh, and then coming back. I've never seen a country fight against a sport like they do here. There's a lot of other things that are very protected in this country. I mean, you go to mainstream media, uh, Rogers and Bell, and they're going to give you everything that they have investment into. And that'll be the NHL, the NHL, and Major League Baseball, some basketball, and then if you're going to look for soccer on any other websites, you have to dig really, really deep. So we're not going to get any help from them, and that's that's fine. So we have to do some promoting on ourselves. The Canadian Soccer Association has to do that. They don't have the money to do that, but they're trying their best to try to promote some of these Canadian players and get some exposure for our national teams and our programs. The national team is also different than club football. We don't have a culture in this country to go support local club football in Canada so that's going to take some time to grow that and investment into that as we've seen with the Canadian Premier League we'll see it with Project 8 but it'll be a slow build but I certainly think we're, we're capable of doing it but we have to realize that there are stumbling blocks and hurdles for us in this country to be able to get up get beyond it and we need to start stop fighting each other because the sport really does I find feed on itself and end up being its worst enemy um, when you're trying to put things forward and, and get ahead it's been very very difficult for our sport. Yeah, the infighting is so obvious. Even Huge. right now with the labor issues, it's just so frustrating. And even from the, uh, the proletariat out there. Yeah, it's talking, funny. There's so many divisive, divisive opinions. You know, the, when we did our poll, we asked for comments, and Ryan at BMB Man 85 I guess he's about 35, 40 years old. I feel like Canada is a backseat soccer nation, if that makes any sense. The country potentially gets wild for things, but stays low in the off-seasons. Doesn't help can that Canada soccer has ripped any momentum they had qualifying for Men's World Cup by omitting, omitting September fixtures. But it just shows you that Canada soccer, and this is kind of what a lot of it is marketing, a lot of it's communications, and mm -hmm. it just shows how important that is to have a stable marketing and communications brand-oriented approach to building in Canada. And if you don't, Things fall apart quickly. You don't, I mean, we went to that Honduras match, Amy, Craig, and I. We had a great time with the Voyagers. It was half full. How many times, why are there no uh, ticket allocations for all of the Ontario League One uh, kids' divisions? Why are there, these, that doesn't make sense to me. So get people in the seats by communicating properly. Tell them when you're going to play. Footy Prime, 7.30, one soccer. <laughs> Tell people when you're going to be on and don't, and don't worry about it sounding braggadocious. It is not. It is just having a conversation. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. 
Right, let's be honest. There's a lot of great words there, by the way. Braggadocious. <laughs> braggadocious. Come on. How the hell did you get braggadocious? Well, I, 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 I went to school for, for six years. I've got to look this up. Is it even a word? It is a word. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. not. Is it? it's There's not. no way it's a word. <laughs> no way it's Braggadocious. Braggadocious. You're going to look me up. You're smarter than he looks. Um... Braggado oh my god, it is a word. It no, is. Yeah. is it urban? Where do you think bragging you came from? It. Uh, praising yourself or speaking too proudly about your own achievements. What are we talking importance. about? Yeah, of course it's a word. Well, I'm impressed, Wonder. You know what but else listen, is a word? Pussyfoot. Now I have to go to the word too. Yes. <laughs> and we don't pussyfoot around the topics on this show, right? No. Right. But there's Dive so much right in. information, misinformation out there as well. Yeah. Right? Um, there's no money in the game in this country. We, we know that. That's got to be adjusted. But for example, the, the, the window that was just went by with no matches. Yeah. It wasn't down to financials. That was out there. That wasn't the reason, right? right? Um, the organization couldn't happen in time. And Saudi Arabia was the team that Canada was supposed to play. I believe it's in James's Park, right? And in the end, they couldn't wait any longer for Canada Soccer to figure this thing out and, and how to do it. What was the so, problem? I, I don't know, but in the end, Costa Rica popped up and said, we'll take that fixture. So, so it wasn't money. The money was there. Who couldn't figure it out? I, I don't know. Canada Soccer, look in the mirror, I guess. Okay, so but the, the easy thing is is to, to point That's fingers crazy. at people and organizations or pillars that are missing or where there's been missteps in terms of building this game, right? But how do we stop it from being so fractured at the club level, provincial level, national level, national teams, mm -hmm. club game, pro game, and start to to galvanize the fan base, but then also the, the soccer minds like Kreger was talking about into something meaningful so that we can take those strides towards becoming a soccer nation. What do we need to do? What's the first step? Is, is it just getting this labor situation sorted, getting the men talking to the women, agreeing, okay, we know that pay equity is gonna happen. Whether you like it or not, and, and there are factions that want it to happen, and there are still factions that don't want it to happen in Canadian soccer, we know that unfortunately, right? But getting that together and getting those deals signed, because right now we're, we're looked upon from the rest of the world right now as being in complete turmoil because we are in complete turmoil. Mm -hmm. Is that the first step? I mean, I, I don't know. Right now they've lawyered up, the men have lawyered up. We know what's happened there, right? It's gonna take a long time. Craig's nodding because he knows this. You know, the, the, the lawyers are there for a reason to make money and they're gonna drag it out as long as possible. From what I understand, the women are pretty close to agreeing and being happy with the deal offered to them, right? It's, it's the men where the issue is at, at the moment. Where are you getting all this information? Um, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia. But, but it's important though, right? It's, it's important it absolutely know, is. Right? Something has to break here at some point. They have to move forward. Is that it, Craig? Is, well, is the CBA gets signed, will that make everything else just follow suit or is that too simplistic? I think that's probably too simplistic, but uh, you know, this, the Canadian soccer business situation is that they've got a contract and I don't think that they're that willing to, to negotiate anything at the moment. They're in a hard contract and they're sitting in a decent spot and it'll be interesting to see what happens down the, down the road as far as people's involvement because of CSB or lack of. Yeah, I don't know if that's the, the the domino that falls and everything follows suit. I don't. I really don't think so. I think that goes a long way towards towards fixing that turmoil and that uncertainty that exists with our national teams and gives them a little bit more of a you mm -hmm. know stronger foothold, mm -hmm. so they can move forward. Especially the women, um, which I women's team has continually been undervalued and undermined. I think throughout these negotiations, but it's it's how you move you move past it. Like I. There, can, there's a lot of egos, though, right? There, yes, but and can I've, Canada soccer be be yeah. a proper federation? Can you know they've talked about bringing in a sporting director? I mean, I know they're being, absolutely being run on a shoestring budget, and Rian's talked about this before. Not just the amount of staff that they have in, but just in terms of how they're paid. If it's an NSO, can we get people in there for it's more of a volunteer position? Can they get paid? Can we treat it properly like a professional organization that it ought to be? Maybe that's the first step. I just think there's there's too much, uh, it's very ego driven. Nobody in this country from grassroots all the way up to the, uh, the CSA want to work with one another. Constantly people are always uh, arguing, fighting, um, and it's wrong because we don't utilize people's best strengths here. Mm -hmm. and, it almost looks like, to me, with people that are in certain positions, whether it's the provincial body, regional body, national team body, they, they look at it as it's their baby, and then they're always looking over their shoulders. 
and they don't want to let people in. There's a lot of good footballing people in this country, ex-alumni or good people that love this game, want to help it, but aren't allowed to get in because it, there's people that are working in these positions right now that are so protective of what they got. Mm -hmm. And precious about their and, own shit. Correct. And it's killing this game from the grassroots all the way up to the CSA. Did Amy say ship? Yeah. Okay. No, Let's I just said make <laughs> but, that, but that's the way it is. In every single position, I'm telling you now, yeah. that is the problem. Because they don't let the good people in that want to actually help make this country better. The fans have to buy in as well, right? We know there's hardcore fans. We get all this, we discussed it already in this show, right? But um, come out and support your, your local CPL team. Watch the matches. When Project 8 launches, come out and support, support, support. Then the money will eventually come, right? Private Canada will realize that needs to invest as well as Craig disappears. Where did Craig go? Shortly. I don't know. He's that angry right now. <laughs> but, I mean, we, we see all the time on, the, on, 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 on social media. We get, we get the most inane, stupid comments well, on a regular basis. Thank you, Sharon, for leading me into this. Uh, at Sunil Sanwaka, 5907, and this is on it from our, uh, our YouTube. I hope you guys don't suck up to one soccer and spend all kinds of time talk CPL. <laughs> so... The, what I would like to say to Sunil is um, we won't <laughs> suck up, we won't suck down. Oh, what God. we will do is suck the appropriate amount. Yes. Because that's <laughs> what we do well. We've been in the industry long enough we <laughs> that we okay. know exactly sorry. how long. That, 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 that kind of comment, no, I'm sorry. I mean, it drives me crazy. It does. Right, Sunil, yeah. listen, maybe you're a Manchester United fan. There's more football in the world than the Premier League, all right? Mm -hmm. Grow it in this country. We'll cover Premier League, yep. English, we'll cover Bundesliga, Syria, Internationals, Project 8, and Canadian Premier League because we want to grow the sport in this country, I'm right? Nice. And, and most people who get on their goddamn high horse and whine about the CPL have never watched a CPL game in their damn lives. They have no idea what to expect. It's pretty good. Well, great drama. To that point, Craig throwing out a Tristan Henry goal, right? Craig, save, like, save. Pardon? The save. Oh, save. sorry, save. A 70-yard save that was a save of that you five years ago would not have been able to do. Correct? Five years what ago. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> not you as a player, but had had CPL not been around, you could not be sharing well, on what? social oh, media. Okay. If Tristan Henry was in the Premier League, if you saw yeah. that save in the Premier if that was Allison with that save, <laughs> yeah. we'd see it around the world in every highlight reel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Every highlight That's reel. my point. That's how good it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it will get exposure. It has got an awful lot of exposure. And I, I was amazed because I saw it first put it up on social media. I, I wasn't watching the game. And then I saw this <laughs> potential save of the season and from 70 about. yards. And I was like, hold on a minute. And then I saw it. I was like, yeah, they might be right. That might be save of the season. I've never seen anything that close from 70 yards out. Great effort. And Tristan Henry, his adjustment and his feet was absolutely brilliant. It was a really, really good save because he started at the top of the box. And that's a position he, he he's supposed to be in. But what an effort from that distance. What, what a ping. I haven't seen one like that since David Beckham against, I think it was Wimbledon back in the day. <laughs> That's right. Wonder if he dressed it up a little bit. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, he was, he was amazing <laughs> save. <laughs> amazing wow. save. Um, all right. So yeah, we got Definitely. to the serious stuff.